Hello and welcome to Turkey Talks. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Phyllis Katman, assistant professor in Aydın University and Kadir Üstün from Washington and myself, Bora Bayraktar. Uh, today we are going to talk about two main issues in international politics. One of them is very uh, hot one. Uh, in Jerusalem, we have seen clashes in the holy places, especially in uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and uh, the compound. Uh, and also, uh, we are going to talk about Turkey's recent operation in the uh, northern part of Iraq against PKK terrorist organization. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, let's start with uh, Israeli-Palestinian question. It's Ramadan and also holidays for uh, Christians and Jews all around the world. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, in one of the most sacred places on the earth, uh, Jerusalem, the Haram Sharif uh, Mosque and the compound is uh, being targeted by extremist uh, groups, especially uh, some right-wing Jewish uh, people. They are forcing, with the help of Israeli security, uh, they are entering the holy places without the consent of the uh, Muslim Waqf in there. And we have seen uh, very violent clashes within the mosque, which is uh, a great concern all around uh, Muslim countries, uh, especially in uh, Arab countries and Turkey. Uh, so, Kadir, I want to start with you. Uh, how do you see these incidents? You know, Turkey's reaction was, uh, again, uh, very hard uh, against uh, these uh, uh, Israeli uh, methods. Uh, how do you see this incident? What is the reason uh, behind all this? This has become a regular thing, as you know. Uh, the Nakba day is approaching from the Palestinian perspective. This is about, you know, Israeli occupation. And uh, they, uh, you know, they've shown uh, for many, many years, as we all know, that they will not uh, simply surrender in East Jerusalem. and. Uh, and we know, we all know Israeli policies of uh, trying to sort of reduce the Palestinian population there and uh, not recognize any kind of sovereignty for the Palestinians, among all the other political issues as well as human rights abuses. Uh, this has become a regular uh, occurrence. And as you know, Jerusalem is a special place for uh, Muslims all around the world. and. Uh, it's much bigger than the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in many senses. And on that front, Turkey uh, consistently, regularly, uh, you know, stands up and voices its uh, opposition and discontent about um, any kind of moves to alter the uh, situation, alter the status quo in, in Jerusalem. Um, and it is, you know, We've seen the heavy-handed policies of the Israeli security forces, and unfortunately, this year again, it's being repeated. Um, from Turkey's perspective, as you know, there's been some recent um, pronouncements by the president, Turkish president, about normalizing ties with Israel, um, especially uh, gas cooperation, energy cooperation in the Eastern Mediterranean. You and I uh, hosted some guests uh, in this program and discussed the dynamics of that rapprochement. Uh, when we look at President Erdogan's recent statements, uh, he he's repeated this many times that this will not come at the expense of Palestinians. Uh, Turkish-Israeli rapprochement or normalization, uh, we should say, because Turkey still doesn't have an ambassador um, in in Israel, in Tel Aviv, um, whatever normalization steps are going to be taken and uh, cooperation over energy, uh, it will not come at the expense of Turkey's support for is, uh, Palestinians. Um, that's a clear message. And, you know, every time we have heightened tensions in in Palestine, you see uh, President Erdogan is pretty much the most vocal leader around the world. And we've seen that when even uh, President Erdogan had good, good relations with Trump 
and Trump, uh, you know, wanted to move uh, the American embassy to Jerusalem and he wanted to recognize, he did recognize Jerusalem as the eternal capital of Israel. Uh, and the strongest reaction uh, came from President Erdogan at the time. And he actually led the Islamic world in creating a common front, common opposition to this move. Um, so I think Turkey's position on that front will not change, has not changed. Uh, Turkey's, you know, as you know, public opinion is very strongly pro-Palestinian in Turkey. And it's not just AK party uh, in Turkey. It's, it's most parties, you know, have brought support for Palestinians, the plight of the Palestinians. So um, without going into too much details, there's not a lot of uh, surprises here, unfortunately, I should say. Uh, and hopefully this month of Ramadan um, will, you know, hopefully we will see reduction in these tensions and uh, end to um, sort of um, end to the human rights abuses on the ground. Uh, as you mentioned, President Erdogan called the Israeli president and uh, expressed Turkey's position clearly about that. Uh, perhaps we can talk about Turkish-Israeli uh, rapprochement dynamics at another occasion, or if you want to talk about it, we can touch upon that as well. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we, we should, I think, uh, go deeper into this, but uh, also from Israeli-Palestinian uh, question point of view, uh, this is very explosive and uh, I'm going to share my uh, opinion about it before, after uh, Phyllis. Uh, Phyllis, uh, you, you are very, uh, I mean, you study uh, especially energy relations in the region, uh, you follow uh, the Turkish-Israeli rapprochement uh, plus you uh, you wrote articles about uh, Israeli uh, energy policy, European energy policy. Uh, but what, what do you, do you think? I mean, after all this, you know, Turkey is investing a lot to this relationship. Israelis seem to be uh, interested, uh, and there is a new world after Russian Ukrainian uh, fighting in in the north. Uh, so Europeans are looking for uh, secure energy routes, new ener energy routes. And uh, me meanwhile, we have seen this uh, escalation in the uh, sacred places, which can poison uh, the uh, planned or projected stability. Uh, what is your opinion about all uh, this? Uh, thank you. Uh, what uh, Mr. Kadir has already mentioned uh, has many uh, insights uh, with regard to what's really going on uh, in the region. Uh, first of all, uh, I think the main point is the uh, internal dynamics of the Israeli politics. What is going on in Israel, in, in Israeli domestic politics, has uh, a lot to do with the recent provocations, uh, quote unquote, uh, in uh, Al Aqsa Mosque. Uh, and in the compound, uh, with regard to uh, the defeat of Netanyahu government, the aftermath of uh, uh, the new uh, government in Israeli politics, uh, we have some instabilities still, which uh, which means that in Israeli domestic politics, uh, we don't have a kind of a strong settlement yet. And uh, because of that, whenever uh, the current government uh, wants to achieve something with regard to the uh, regional politics, with regard to uh, rapprochement with the uh, uh, regional uh, states, including Turkey. Uh, I think uh, there is a, some kind of uh, opposition uh, which wants to distract or which uh, wants to destabilize uh, such movements. Uh, what you have already mentioned together with uh, Mr. Kadir uh, is very much uh, one of these factors, which is the, the recent uh, role of Israel, both in Ukrainian-Russian uh, negotiations and also with regard to the energy issue that Israel may, Israel may contribute to the European energy security via a cooperation with Turkey, uh, possibly together with, with uh, Egypt, uh, instead of uh, being connected with the East Met uh, pipeline. So, 
when we think about the current dynamics, uh, we have uh, we should also look at another uh, factor, which is the role of United States in Israeli politics. Uh, what Mr. Kader has already mentioned with regard to Trump administration, we have seen a very positive relations uh, between the uh, two countries. But when uh, we have the Biden administration came into power, even in uh, during the campaign, uh, we have seen that uh, the American policy will not put Iran uh, to the target, uh, which creates some kind of tension between Israel and the United States of America. And when uh, Biden came into power, uh, the main target, the main threat uh, expressed from the mouth of the president was Russia. And uh, it was uh, China from the mouth of the Secretary of State Blinken. So th this kind of issue uh, created some kind of problem between the uh, between American uh, in, in in American Israeli politics. On, on the other hand, uh, we should also look at the recent uh, developments in the Middle East, uh, which try to create some kind of. Uh, clear out uh, on the ground uh, by the Western powers. Why? Because uh, based on the intelligence reports that Russia has some intention to uh, invade uh, Ukrainian territories, uh, they were they were trying to clear the grounds in other conflict areas. Thus, we have seen many uh, positive uh, developments in the Middle East, especially between the Gulf countries versus uh, other uh, countries, including Turkey, uh, United Arab Emirates versus Turkish relations. Uh, many We have seen many positive developments in the region. Why? Because they wanted to concentrate on this Russian uh, threat uh, and uh, Chinese threat. One more thing, the importance of Middle East uh, here is with regard to Belt and Road Initiative of China. We all know that the uh, land route of uh, Belt and Road Initiative passes through Middle East, uh, goes through Iraq, Iran, Turkey border, uh, passes through Turkey and reaches to uh, Moscow to uh, London. So. Uh, United States of America and primarily the uh, British uh, counterpart wants to uh, create some kind of a position which uh, creates some kind of uh, prevention in the uh, development of the Belt, or Belt and Road Initiative. Thus, we, ha we also have AUKUS initiative, again, uh, together with Australia. These uh, countries uh, had a cooperation against any possible development in, uh, against uh, China. So we, we may think that this, um, this recent uh, provocation in uh, uh, Al-Aqsa Al Al Mosque is some kind of related to Middle East, but it has broader impacts, which includes Eastern Mediterranean energy resource, like you mentioned, uh, with regard to Israeli domestic politics and with regard to recent uh, developments in, in the Middle Eastern politics and together with the uh, increasing role of Israel in the Russian-Ukrainian negotiations and also in the European energy security. Professor Katman, can I ask a question, uh, Bora? Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, f you you mentioned Israeli domestic politics. It's very important. I think departure of Netanyahu was seen in Turkey as as part of a sort of new era potentially in uh, Israeli politics, Israel's foreign relations, especially. Um, but uh, at the same time, now you know, I think the uh, coalition government is is weakened with the resignation of a, um, I think, Islamist party member. So it's, it's things are much more fragile domestically. Um, but on the energy front, which is your sort of more expertise area uh, in Eastern Mediterranean, can you uh, explain how, you know, Turkish rapprochement uh, could, could um, Turkish rapprochement with Israel how could that change the dynamics in the Eastern Mediterranean? Because as far as I know, Israel doesn't want to sort of uh, give up its relations, uh, improved relations with uh, Greece and uh, uh, Southern Cyprus as well. But at the same time, uh, the financially viable 
route is through Turkey, as far as I know, for the Israeli gas to get to Europe and after Ukraine, like you, you talked about. Uh, that's very important now, uh, where the gas is coming from. Uh, there's immense pressure on Europeans to reduce reliance on Russia. Can you explain that dynamic and how uh, the natural gas could actually or is bringing uh, Turkey and Israel uh, together towards the rapprochement. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, what you mentioned with regard to domestic policies in, is in Israel, this is what I tried to mention that the weakened coalition uh, has some kind of connection here. Uh, with regard to energy, uh, I think uh, the uh, starting point should be the uh, COVID-19 pandemic because uh, COVID-19 created some kind of imbalance in the energy uh, market, uh, some kind of disturbances in the supply and demand, which created an energy shock right now. But it is added with the Ukrainian crisis, it became unbearable for primarily for the European countries. And uh, when we talk about the uh, European energy security, we have American interests here, because America is also providing some kind of liquid natural gas to the European countries, but the amount that is necessary for the European countries is way lower than the current uh, possible alternatives to uh, Russian gas. Thus, uh, they looked for other alternatives, which may be uh, primarily the uh, Eastern Mediterranean gas plus Central Asian uh, energy reserves and also uh, Azerbaijan resource. And when we talk about all these uh, resources, uh, we have one country which is the white one, which is Turkey. So in that manner, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, both Egypt and Israel notified that the uh, market, the demand for gas uh, can only be uh, met with, via Turkey. So we have seen that both these countries wanted to have better relations or, or, or let me say rapprochement with Turkey. So the approach, uh, the demand came from these countries right after uh, COVID-19 uh, became uh, less, uh, how can I say, risky uh, in, the, uh, in the world. When we talk about the Eastern Mediterranean gas reserves, the capacity is very much. But the problem is uh, we have the technical difficulty uh, because Eastern Mediterranean Sea is a very deep sea, which requires a, a huge engineering, which means extra cost. And when, when we think about the extra cost, it means that you need to find more credit. And when we think about the current situation, because of the COVID-19, again, we have a very... Uh, how can I say, fragile situation in terms of financing such expensive projects. Moreover, uh, we have also another issue, which is the insurance. Insurance companies has already have already announced that they will not provide insurance to the Eastern Mediterranean pipeline. Th thus, uh, we have uh, another alternative, which is not Turkey, uh, what you have already mentioned with regards to Israel tries to uh, keep uh, its relations with Greece, uh, Egypt, uh, and a uh, Greek uh, separate part. They also work on alternative uh, scenario. What is that scenario? Taking the reserve uh, via a kind of a pipeline over uh, Egypt uh, and uh, then take it from uh, Africa uh, to uh, Europe. But the problem is that, uh, again, when we think about the American interests, uh, when we think about the role of Turkey, uh, not only in terms of energy security, but in terms of the regional security, Black Sea security, Mediterranean security, and, we, and when we think about the uh, Trans-Anatolian pipeline uh, coming from Azerbaijan, passes through Turkey, reaching to uh, Greece, that, uh, and uh, carry the uh, Azeri uh, energy resource to, uh, to uh, trans Adriatic pipeline top. Uh, we, we have another Turkey. We have another role for Turkey. So, in terms of uh, economic uh, perspective, in terms of making these options more economic, uh, instead of looking for political interests, looking for other interests, uh, I think 
they uh, the most viable option they have seen uh, is Turkey. And when we add these options together with the Central uh, Asian uh, reserves, because we know that uh, the status of uh, Caspian uh, is over, we have a kind of resolution over there. So uh, there is a plan that there will be a Trans-Caspian pipeline which will reach to Azerbaijan and from Azerbaijan to the TANAP, which requires no extra, uh, how can I say, um, investment, money, uh, financial support. Uh, so uh, European energy security uh, has another alternative here. All, all in these scenarios, uh, we should look at how the current conflicts can be resolved. And in international relations, we have a theory called functionalism, which is the founding theory of the European uh, Union uh, right after Second World War. Uh, they, th those countries had many political problems, but they have seen their economic interests. What they needed most was energy resources and some kind of steel. So they just moved away all the political problems and preferred to cooperate uh, in the areas that they needed most. We have a similar scenario right now. We are in the in economic shock, we are in energy shock, and we have climate change approaching. The impacts of climate change uh, is uh, will, uh, in, will increase day by day. So we have many problems, political problems, Ukrainian crisis, uh, economic problems, hyperinflation, and we have energy problems. Yeah. So instead of focusing on the political aspects, I think Israel and Egypt uh, also were convinced by primarily European uh, countries and United States of America uh, to uh, choose Turkish option uh, over other ones. Yeah, maybe at this point uh, we should underline uh, as uh, another issue. I mean, uh, this Al-Aqsa incident also uh, it, it's a big problem. I mean, I, I think uh, Israelis are, uh, their analysis uh, is uh, not in the right place uh, from my point of view, because while, I mean, all these things that you explained uh, for Israel, for Europe, for US, for many countries, uh, there is a, a need of, uh, there, there is a need of stability in the region. Uh, and Israel believes that they have reached a point that they secured, that they feel uh, confident uh, after uh, Abraham Accords, after uh, US positioning uh, about uh, their uh, embassy in Jerusalem. Uh, now Turkey is talking with Israelis, but uh, things can easily turn around and this Al-Aqsa incident is very explosive. I think uh, when we look at uh, the last 20 years uh, after the Camp David uh, negotiations in uh, year 2000, when uh, both sides came together uh, in U.S., Yasser Arafat and Ehud Barak, Israeli Prime Minister of the time, uh, they talked about final status issues, and you should not forget that uh, these uh, negotiations collapsed due to the uh, disagreement over the status of Jerusalem. I remember uh, Yasser Arafat said he, uh, he was not going to be the Arab who will gi uh, give up, uh, who would give up uh, Jerusalem, and uh, he didn't want to continue negotiations. And after that, remember, in 2000, uh, September 28, uh, Likud party leader of the time, Ayah Sharon, had made uh, a very uh, controversial visit to the holy places to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which initiated and triggered uh, the second Palestinian Al uh, Palestinian Intifada, which lasted for five years. And we remember the violence. Uh, and from that point uh, on, Israelis uh, choose the way of unilateralism. They uh, quit negotiations in a, a certain extent, and they started to implement uh, their own policies in the region building the wall uh, around the West Bank. Uh, they started to reoccupy Palestinian territories, and this lasted uh, for years. And I think after 20 years, the Israeli uh, politicians feel confident enough to ignore Palestinian demands. And now 
the Judaization of Jerusalem came to the uh, walls of the holy places, the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque and Harem Sharif compound. Uh, I think this is very dangerous uh, and it can be very explosive and things, as I uh, told at the beginning, can turn around easily and we can see all the negotiations, all the accords, everything uh, may collapse in uh, seconds, in minutes, uh, and this can uh, put uh, Israel into a very difficult situation. I think most Israelis don't get that. Uh, they don't understand the sensitivity uh, of the uh, situation. But uh, recently, I mean, after President Erdogan's uh, talks with uh, the Israeli counterpart, uh, we have seen that uh, Israeli security is now trying to for, uh, stop uh, Jewish extremists to uh, go into the uh, compound. So I think this is very important and uh, dangerous situation. But uh, I agree, energy is the uh, backbone of the negotiations between Turkey, Israel and other countries. Uh, but uh, again, we have to watch uh, Al-Aqsa very carefully because it can... Uh, derail all the peace process and peace talks or uh, normalization talks uh, among uh, nations in the region. So uh, maybe I should move to uh, Turkey's recent operation uh, in northern Iraq because uh, now we uh, Turkey is uh, doing another operation against terrorists while uh, there is other uh, conflicts all around but Turkey's fight against terrorism continues and uh, this time, uh, in northern Iraq, Turkey is doing uh, air and uh, land operations, uh, joint operations against uh, the organization. Uh, Kadir, uh, why do you think Turkey started this uh, operation these days, while uh, other uh, tensions around Turkey going on? What was the message of Turkey? Well, Bora, I think uh, the pressure is on. It has been on for a while. Uh, Turkey's message is that, you know, it's not going to look the other way. Um, and the PKK, through its Syrian branch and uh, YPG and uh, other groups, it cannot find, uh, sort of, find it easy uh, to exist and operate uh, in northern uh, Iraq and northern Syria. Uh, this has been the message for a while now, for several years, as you know, uh, after the collapse of the negotiations settlement process uh, between the Turkish government and the uh, PKK, it's been a while. Uh, after that process collapsed, uh, Turkey has been uh, putting pressure on PKK because it has found some support from the United States and uh, Europe in the name of fighting ISIS in northern Syria. Uh, but Turkey now controls several areas in northern Syria. It has cleared uh, its border with Syria from ISIS elements as well as PKK elements. Um, and it is uh, seeing, Turkey is seeing uh, sort of its border with Syria and Iraq kind of uh, being uh, as part of a the same story in many ways because PKK, as you know, uh, through its proxies, through its various branches uh, and subcontractors, operates uh, to to kind of uh, you know threatening Turkey, but also uh, trying to uh, get legitimized in the eyes of the West. And it has had some success on that front, but as we have seen, Turkey conducted direct military operations in Syria to disrupt this process and, uh, you know, they've been under immense pressure. And this has been a source of uh, tension between the United States and Turkey because of the U.S. support for YPG, which, you know, most uh, analysts, politicians, and even current politicians, they do recognize YPG as part of the PKK. But Turkey's operation is is not um, for political reasons, I think. Uh, it, but it has, it is trying to, uh, you know, show its consistent message, repeat its consi consistent message that 
there is no sort of going to be uh, easy area of operation for for the PKK. Um, uh, because, you know, the, sometimes people make the comment it's it's geared towards elections, but there's no elections until not next, next year. And even then, uh, this is an issue that unites, you know, political parties in Turkey. Uh, PKK's uh, operations against PKK has really strong support. And this is a designated uh, organization by the West, by the United States and Europe. Uh, Turkey has never uh, met with uh, serious opposition to its operations into Iraq because it justifies it under self-defense articles. Uh, so, um, and, you know, that kind of pressure on the PKK uh, will continue in the foreseeable future, I think, and uh, Turkey will continue to bring up uh, with the United States its support for the PKK. And, and remember, we discussed this in recent weeks. The United States and Turkey have created this uh, common strategy coordination mechanism, and I think this is going to be the top item there from for the Turkish side when the U.S. wants to kind of avoid that subject and talk about Ukraine and other issues. Uh, I think Turkey will consistent will keep bringing that issue to the table and try to push the U.S. to end its support for the YPG, uh, which has been limited under Biden, to be honest. It hasn't kind of broadened. It hasn't been, uh, it continued, but it hasn't strengthened. So that's good news for Turkish-American relations, but there's also that context. I think I agree uh with the point that, you know, uh, Turkey's main concern, motive and uh, goal is to fight against terrorism. This organization uh, is fighting, has been fighting against Turkey for the last 40 years. They killed civilians in Turkey's big cities. They attacked Turkish borders, Turkish uh, institutions. So it's uh, clear and uh, justifiable self-defense of Turkey. This is what I think. But at the same time, uh, I have a feeling that uh, it, all of these things with, uh, are related with uh, energy uh, competition or energy uh, issues. Because uh, that after 2014, when there was a joint project, joint efforts against Turkey uh, by supporting PKK, YPG and other uh, terrorist groups, uh, we have seen many Western countries supporting these organizations. We have seen their media, how they try to legitimize a terrorist organization, terrorist women, uh, you know, even many uh, mainstream magazines uh, published articles uh, about uh, this uh, terrorist organization. Uh, and there was kind of effort to bypass Turkey uh, with uh, opening a corridor uh, controlled by PKK, YPG uh, in 2014-2015. We have seen that. Uh, I think this is also part of Turkey's efforts to break uh, any possible isolation uh, by uh, using this uh, terrorist organization. Uh, Filiz, do you uh, agree with that? I mean, would you uh, do you have any feelings about all of these terrorist uh, activities uh, in Turkey's southern border, do you think there was kind of project which we cannot, of course, uh, prove it, but the indications, uh, do you think Turkey is also breaking uh, the uh, isolation uh, via these uh, operations? Uh, it's definitely uh, correct, I think. Uh, again, uh, the location of uh, the uh, PKK uh, terrorist organization camps uh, are quite interesting because it is the point where United States of America uh, constructed the biggest uh, embassy compound in the world, uh, which also uh, at the very place where the uh, Bent Route of Belt and Road Initiative of China passes through 
uh, uh, Turkey, uh, from Iraq to Turkey. So uh, what is going, in, or going on in that territory, it seems like a kind of regional issue, but it has regional dynamics, it has some kind of Iraqi dynamics, it has impacts on, on, on Turkish um, strength, Turkish power uh, in the territory. And when we look at the operation, the timing of the operation, we should definitely talk about the Turkey's uh, uh, overall success in uh, fight against terrorism in internally. Uh, the, uh, the recent uh, achievements in the defense industry, especially the uh, uh, unmanned uh, controlled uh, vehicles, air vehicles, uh, we have capacity uh, to uh, collect uh, intelligence, it now became a, a, a point where beyond collecting uh, intelligence, uh, Turkey has capacity to uh, use it uh, for uh, counter-terrorism operations, which uh, created some kind of advantage uh, in the Turkish side in, in um, countering terrorism operations against PKK. And when we look at the timing, again, we should definitely uh, look at uh, which countries uh, have uh, some kind of role in this uh, territory. And uh, here we should recall the recent argument that there is a kind of second Yalta document negotiated between uh, Russia and the Western countries, uh, primarily NATO countries. And according to some leaked information, there are some items which have not been uh, agreed on. And one of the items that Russia put on the table table is with regard to what is going on in, in this territory that you mentioned about this corridor. And according to the uh, leaked information, uh, Russia uh, put on the table uh, by uh, in order to make the other side to accept uh, her offers uh, in return, Russia said that if they don't accept the offers of Russia, Russia will let Turkey to take this terrorist uh, threat out from the region. So when we look at the recent uh, close relations between Turkey and Russia, especially during this Ukrainian conflict, uh, the timing of the operation seems like, like in the case of uh, the events in uh, the, the provocations in uh, al, al al Mosque, uh, I think it is not a coincidence that it somehow Russia wants uh, Russia plays a role here uh, by saying that yeah. we all know that there was an uh, agreement between uh, Russia, Israel, and United States of America during Trump administration uh, on uh, the sharing the role in this region, uh, and we have seen that Russian and American troops were leaving uh, its uh, places to one after another without touching each other, even some kind of weapons. Uh, were left by the American army, and everybody was surprised. But according to this uh, agreement, uh, and then I think uh, two years before, uh, it says that Russia uh, will work towards taking the role of Iran in the in Libya, I'm, in Lebanon. I'm sorry, in in Syria, in Iraq, and in return. Uh, yeah. America will give the control of uh, the Syria to Russia. And after that uh, agreement, we have seen Russians take the control of the territories that once upon a time American army was located. But now we have Biden administration and th these countries have announced that this agreement is no longer in, in, in place. Yeah. And uh, well, in October, Russia wanted to negotiate with the United States of America again via Israel. But we yeah. have not seen a positive response from here. So what is going on in Israel? What is going on in, in this uh, Turkish-Iraqi border? And possibly maybe in, in, in Syrian border, we don't know. Uh, it's very much related to this uh, power sharing uh, between and among these countries, I guess. And competition, yeah. Yeah, uh, and Okay. Well. okay, with this, we came to the end of this program. Uh, thank you very much, Kadir. Thank you very much, Felice. We talked thank about uh, 
uh, the Alaksa incident, uh, the violence in the uh, holy places, and Turkey's recent operation in northern Iraq. So uh, with this, we came to the end of the show. See you next time, and have a nice week. Thank you. Thank you.